conditions, at some point it's just going to stop reproducing, uh, stop dividing. How do, you, how do you deal with that? So this is an old idea that has actually not been current within gerontology, within the study of the biology of aging, for at least 50 or 60 years now. It's now well understood that we have a load of programs in our body that cause us to age as slowly as we do, that defend against aging, but that aging itself is certainly not programmed. And therefore, that what we need to do in order to extend our health beyond what we might call our warranty period is to uh, augment the automatic inbuilt repair and maintenance machinery that we have with medical repair and maintenance to keep the body going in a healthy state for longer. Our warranty period, of course, Dan, is just until we uh, procreate. I mean, that, that Darwinian-wise, evolutionary-wise, yeah. that's what we're on Earth for, right? Well, procreative success, it's not only getting to the age of procreation but also getting to the age when our children have children because we have an effect on that too um, but as we see among the 250 so centenarians that I interviewed uh, these people uh, tend to be not only uh, make it to 100 but also productive uh, I think the flawed premise is that if we raise life expectancy uh, it's all going to be health care costs and we have to uh, worry about supporting these people but what you see is people grow older in these uh, communities, they tend, they tend to uh, um, continue to contribute to it. Uh, among these centenarians, for example, you see them uh, still running city councils, or if they're in their home, they're running right. a garden. Uh, and you have to remember, they possess a, a font of accumulated knowledge over those hundred years that help the younger generations survive. It's, it's interesting because I think in so many cultures, uh, around the age of 65, somewhat arbitrarily, uh, you're often discarded from your professional life and also from your personal life as well, to your point, unless you've developed those strong social connections. But I also want to talk about the impact that the mind might have as well on our quest to live longer. Here's a question from Cameron in Australia. He writes this, I've heard the real benefit of exercise that it keeps your mind healthy as you age. Um, is that right, first of all, to you, and why? And, and let me say as well, Cameron, let's take a journey to the Mediterranean. What, what you're looking at right now is video from Dan Butner and his team of researchers on an expedition to Greece it was on the island of Icaria that they discovered another longevity hotspot, the fifth blue zone, as they call it. Not only do one in three people live to be over 90 years old in Icaria, but not a single person on the island that you found, at least, yeah. has dementia. Yeah, we found everybody over 90. Now, in America, for example, if you're a woman uh, and you hit age 90, you have a 40% chance of suffering from dementia. I'm sorry, 60% if you're a woman, 40% uh, if you're a man. Uh, so, you know, why... Why well, work to get to be 100 if you're, if you're not going to have um, all your mental faculties? Here, either th through some combination of what they eat or what they do, they were eluding um, dementia completely. One of the things they do, they live in an environment that um, forces them to walk all the time and usually uphill. You're hard-pressed to find 100 meters of flat uh, terrain in Acadia. Hmm. So they're going up and down all the time. But one of the things we found interesting were their teas. Um, uh, Religiously, and we did a dietary survey of all these 90 years, throughout their life they were drinking one of five different kinds of teas, and all of them were diuretics. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, and they're drinking it their entire life. Well, if you're diagnosed with high blood pressure, often the first drug your doctor is going to prescribe is a diuretic, it lowers blood pressure. So we theorized perhaps that because they were drinking these, these uh, herbal teas, that they had chronically kept their blood pressure lower. Now, one of the ways you get uh, dementia is through Alzheimer's disease, but another one is if you have high blood pressure your entire life, you sometimes get little strokes. It, it uh, compromises your, your, uh, uh, the blood vessels in your brain. So we think that perhaps they have fewer of these small strokes because of these teas they're drinking. That's fascinating. I've also heard of antioxidants as well. I don't know if you've heard this, Aubrey, but, for example, in many Eastern cultures, they use uh, turmeric a lot in their diet, yeah, which is going to be a very powerful antioxidant. Yes, but th the point is you can't just use it for a little while. Uh, you have to ritualistically use it, and that's what you see. In the, it's something you have to do most of your life. You can't like start and get all excited about it for a year and then go off it. You have to figure out ways so you're nudged into taking these teas of turmeric you, almost your entire life. Since, since I told my wife about that study, uh, she's been putting turmeric in all my food. I'm not <laughs> sure if she thinks I'm losing my mind or my memory or what's going on. It tastes good, too. It, it does <laughs> taste good. You know, something else we, we should talk about with regard to lifestyle is certainly stress. What people don't realize is the impact stress has on the aging process. And I can tell you that
that internalizing stress impacts your health literally from head to toe. It can trigger your jaw to tighten, that can cause migraine headaches, can impact your heart by suppressing normal blood pressure flow, increasing your risk for heart disease and stroke, which Dan was just talking about, throws your digestive system off, resulting in heartburn, cramps, impacts your sleep schedule as well, which can lower your immune system. But here's the thing that I was sort of struck by is that a lot of these hot spots, um, they got stressed too. Yes, I mean, yeah. they're trying to take care of their kids, pay the bills, do all the things that cause stress. So what, what is it? If stress is such a big killer, so to speak, why are they getting away with it? Yeah, you tell people that you found a, uh, a centenarian hotspot in a Mediterranean island, and they, so they say, of course, if I lived on an island, right. I wouldn't be stressful. But they worry about their children. They worry about health. Um, many, in many of these cultures, they've actually had starvation. Uh, what they have that a lot of us don't have are, are mechanisms to shed that stress. And how do they do it? It's either through prayer or through a type of meditation. We know that people who take naps five times a week, a half hour time, have about a 35% lower chance of cardiovascular disease than people who don't take naps. We know that happy hours. Um, so what's important is to learn these. You know, when you're stressed out, when you're in a hurry, uh, your body triggers this inflammatory response, which uh, wreaks havoc on your joints, wreak ha wreaks havoc on your arteries, actually wrinkles your skin. So if you can take this 15 minutes a day to turn that inflammatory state around, either through prayer, meditation, or happy hour, um, you're battling this, this stress. Yeah, this stress. And, and the key thing is that this is not just specific to these locations, these regions where there's a lot of longevity. People who have studied centenarians the world over, even in places where centenarians are rare, have found exactly the same thing, that centenarians may have had a stressful life, but they really know how to cope with stress. They really know how not to let it get to them. It's not the stressful environment itself, it's the consequences in, internally of the stressful environment. And if you know how to handle stress, then you're going to do well. Centenarians, the one thing they have the most in common is nothing bothers them. You're, you heard Dan describing some of these things, meditating, uh, taking naps. Uh, do, do you do some of this stuff? I, mean, I personally don't do any of the things like that. I just seem to be one of those genetically lucky people where everything goes right. I can eat and drink what I like and I never put on any weight and I have really, really good blood numbers and everything like that. So I actually am at the end of the spectrum where it makes sense for me to be unusually conservative, unusually cautious about what changes I might make, what supplements I might take, things like that. People at the other end of the spectrum who've drawn some short straws genetically, for example, um, would be justified in perhaps being a bit more experimental, a bit more ambitious in terms of what things they might do for their diet or for supplements or other lifestyle changes. People in the middle, you know, you don't want to do anything too risky. I certainly wouldn't recommend that anyone would megadose on any vitamin. Um, but something like taking a five cent multivitamin every day, something completely conservative, makes good sense. You, it's interesting. So when you say that you're genetically lucky, are, is that some of the, you're sort of confident that some of the things that you're describing are going to be able to help you? Is that why you, you know, eat what you want and not worry about these other things? Or? It's, it's certainly not about me, no. It's not about me personally. The thing that drives me is the humanitarian aspect, the fact that out of 150,000 people that die worldwide every day, roughly two-thirds die of aging, one way or another. In other words, they die of causes that young adults essentially hardly ever die of. In the industrialized world, of course, the proportion is much higher. It's around 90 percent. So that's what drives me. I know that if I, by my work, were able, for example, to hasten the defeat of aging by five years, then that would only change my own probability of making the cut by a small amount. But every day I could save a hundred thousand lives that's easy to get worked up about when you talk about again this this idea that's happening happening rapidly if you have um, people in their 50s or 60s that are watching right now uh, if you if you predict the future a little bit for us what, what are we talking about what sort of changes would they see most concretely so of course the big difficulty in answering that question is that we're talking about technology which will really only come to fruition in at, at least 20 years from now, perhaps longer. And any technology that's that far away, the exact time frame is extremely speculative. Mm -hmm. But I would say that there's a 50% chance that we will have all of these technologies firmly and comprehensively in place within about 25 years. Now, that means that people who are, let's say, 50 years old now, 75 in 25 years from now, will have a pretty good chance of benefiting from these things, just so long as they do what Dan tells them to in the minute. <laughs> Reversing aging and prolonging life. Yeah, slowing aging down in the short term and delaying aging in order to live long enough to reverse aging in the future. Dan, Dan I'm curious because in some ways what you guys are talking about are, is very similar. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it's very different as well. You're, you're, you're at one end of the spectrum in terms of preventing things, and 
Aubrey is working at a uh, sort of the regenerative or the other end of the spectrum. What do you? Th I mean, you you know Aubrey's work, I'm sure. What, yeah. What do you? Uh, it's awkward to ask you as he's sitting right here, but what do you think of this, uh, given the work that you do? I think it's brilliant. I think. Uh, Aubrey's work offers the best chance of breaking through the ceiling right now. And this is a bit of an oversimplification, but for the average person right now, the ceiling's 90. If you eliminate chronic disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, uh, most of us would still be dying at age 90. What Aubrey's talking about is breaking through that. Uh, I talk about some of the things that will stack your deck in favor of being around for one of the technologies he's talking about kick in. Um, so, um, in, in a way, I, you're sort of lining people up to, to be able to benefit one day yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. You know, I hand him the baton at a certain point. I've, I've been able to make some progress, I think, over the years in getting people to be a bit more, to have more of a sense of proportion about this. But really, one thing that it really comes down to is that people think of aging as being distinct from the age related diseases like Alzheimer's and um, cardiovascular disease and so on. And that's completely wrong biologically. The correct way to think about the biology is that the diseases of old age are aspects of the later stages of aging, which means that if you attack aging itself, then you postpone.